Mark. Um, yeah, I, I'll share my screen in a moment, um, but just briefly, I will give you a little bit of a background about who I am and how I came into evaluation. Um, as Mark mentioned, uh, in my first career, I was a nurse and, uh, and it equipped me so incredibly well to be a documentary filmmaker, actually. It's all, I was a nurse, I was a high, high, I often worked in high dependency and intensive care and, um, you know, communicating, um, you know, I had to learn to communicate actually without language a lot of the time. And, uh, you know, which really was tapping into, I suppose, what Carl Jung would call the field, right? And actually looking at you know, what was spoken beyond the words and feeling into somebody's body. Now, that is incredibly um, important in my job, not only as a documentary filmmaker, full stop, but my documentary filmmaker working with people um, of different na nationalities and not, um, you know, English not being a first language. So I can actually... Um, you know, be able to actually ask those really challenging questions as well and know how um, far I can go and how, when to back off and all of those sorts of things. These are incredibly important soft skills that I learned uh, when I was nursing. Um, earn people's trust really quickly as well, you know, um, uh, was another amazing skill that I learned. And I don't think I would have actually learned these anywhere else but in nursing. So, you know, I actually really honour that career and um, I also honour all of the nurses that stick around in that career because it's a, a really, really tough, tough job. And, um, yeah, so I honour those ones that stick around to, to serve the communities. So I will be sharing with you today um, uh, my experience of, of working uh, with First Nations people. I've been working in the Story Catchers now for about 10 years. Actually, over a decade we've been running that business and um, I have learned a lot about myself and my own colonisation and my, you know, the place that I have in this, in this um, community that I live in. So I'll be sharing a little bit about that with you as well as sharing the methodology that we have created, being uh, Larissa and myself, which you'll find more out about. So I'll share my screen now. Um, and if we've got time, I will be, um, oh, here. Yeah. I will be uh, sharing a video with you as well. So, um, hmm, sorry, I have to actually stop sharing that now. Thumbs up, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Cool. Um, excellent. So I actually recently read this book uh, not so long ago, and I can't actually remember what the title was actually now. Cool, but it was by Hans Rosling. I don't know if you've actually anybody's heard of him, but he uh, stated a quote in there that really jumped out at me, which is, um, "The world cannot be understood without numbers. However, the world cannot be understood with numbers alone." And uh, particularly when we're talking about people programs, we will not understand really what's going on if we uh, are only collecting the, num the numbers. It just doesn't give anything justice, really, um, particularly people's experiences, you know. So um, to honour their experiences, we need the stories. And uh, stories are, you know, often... Uh, not only quite difficult to catch, but they are actually very um, uh, difficult to analyse too because there's a lot of stuff that goes on beyond the words that are spoken, which is what I was sort of alluding to before. So, I mean, as I've um, just stated, you know, the stories is actually you know, one of the most powerful ways we actually can learn about one another and the way we share ideas and build bridges. 
And it's crucial for how we are evolving in our society, how we're going to do that without story, you know. Um, you know, I was, I was sitting in this uh, elder circle a few weeks ago and, um, you know, I was watching the elders tell their stories about, it was actually about the yes, um, the yes vote and uh, the yes campaign. And I was just watching the, the kids and how they were so incredibly engaged with these, you know, the older generations and the stories that they were telling. And, in fact, actually it wasn't even so much the stories. They were just enamoured with the, with the elders full stop, you know. I think that, um, and I'll talk a little bit that, about that later on, about, you know, my experience with that. But, you know, story is this amazing way that we can, you know, collect and our experiences and and use it if we know how how to 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 measure and um, measure those experiences. We've also um, created this methodology that can be used in human centered design as well as um, in social impact measurement and monitoring and evaluation, which I'll be sharing with you a little bit later in the presentation. But um, yeah, so it's an evidence-based methodology that uses um, most significant change a process, which we've integrated film into. And it sort of goes quite a lot beyond that because we've also used it in our reporting method uh, methods as well as, um, you know, in our workshops and our engagement processes. So this is some of the country that I, I work in. I'm so incredibly grateful to work up in this. This is the APY lands um, as we're entering into the, the lands. It's a super beautiful place in the world. So at the Story Catchers, we're um, digital producers and monitoring and evaluation specialists. I have two different um, monitoring and evaluation specialists that I work with. Um, and one is here in uh, Adelaide on Ghana country and the other is over, I think she's just moved to the East Coast somewhere. I can't be sure what country she is on now, but she worked very much um, it, uh, based in Alice Springs for a long time. Um, as I just stated before, we use a uh, MSC process and, you know, this is a really awesome way to... Um, you know, uncover those unintended outcomes that we often, um, you know, won't hear if we don't actually collect the stories. Um, I remember this one time I was, uh, we had an evaluation years ago, actually, and we were collecting stories um, around a driver's licensing program. And um, one of the young fellows shared with me that, you know, because he got his licence, he he got a job at the local school as the as the Aboriginal education worker and because he was a traditional man, he thought, oh, well, actually I'm going to introduce a program into the school that, you know, if the young fellas come to school every day, I'll take them out hunting on Friday nights, you know. And so, you know, within two weeks he got the, the um, attendance rate up at the school to 100%. He'd introduced culture back into these, you know, in the sense of hunting and what have you into these young fellas' lives. And uh, and he got a job, you know. Like it was just that how would we actually even know what those um, ripple effects are of, of getting a licence if we didn't actually take the time to to listen to the stories and ask those right, you know, the, the, the questions, uh, the right questions. So how we use the documentary film, um, we use it for project research, participatory workshops, focus groups, community conversations. Um, we also create visual case studies and docu-video reports um, for the communication and communication content as well. Um, we also you create ArcGIS story maps, which is something that we've just started doing uh, recently, which we can map where the stories come from um, and all of the um, 
and yeah, it's a really awesome way to not only map the stories, but to be able to actually show their report in a in a visual way and an interactive way that they can sort of look at the maps. Um, so using the film, it makes the process so much more accessible and inclusive for all the demographics that we work with. And they're very, uh, you know, it's an incredibly empowering process as well for them. Um, so what our methodology measures is um, our process uncovers the unintended and, in, um, and intended outcomes, the barriers, the enablers, the concerns and ideas for change, as well as the program stories for change. You, you know, another uh, really interesting story that we collected recently um, from a program that we were, um, that we are evaluating is is the fact that, you know, our, our government services have, have, you know, translation services for something like 60 different languages, but not one Indigenous language from South Australia. And it was like, wow, that is amazing, you know. And so now they've been able to actually, you know, integrate that into another department and say, hey, you know, we need to start getting some services, some translation services for uh, people living on country or or not, people living in the city, you know, that um, have a different Aboriginal dialects as their first language. <clears throat> so it gives community a real voice. And um, so I'm trying to get off all these things that are on my screens. <laughs> um, negates service providers speaking on the behalf of the end user or even translating, you know, what they're trying to say because you know obviously there's a lot of things that get lost in translation um when you know you're speaking on behalf of someone else so uh the communities become a key part of the co-creation of finding solutions and evaluating their own programs um the feedback loops that happen because of this a process which I'll take you more into in a minute. Um, so we're working with the community for the community. We work really closely with um, the, our, our clients who are all First Nations people and really take their lead on, on cultural and um, community needs and, and personal needs as well. So... Um, and we create robust feedback. I mean, the, the whole process of, of documentary film, using documentary film is has this ability to create robust feedback loops between government organisations, funding bodies, stakeholders, communities and individuals. I mean, we were running some workshops um, at the end of last year and we had a lot of different departments in the same room as one another and just watching them or listening to them after they had watched the documentaries and listening to the sharing that happened after saying, wow, we can really work together in this and I can see how my program can really, um, you know, enhance your program and benefit your program. And so it's a beautiful cross-pollination was going on and it's because, you know, we've got this film that we can share across so many different um, departments. And then, you know, working together, wow, how amazing is that, you know, to be able to have different departments like SAPOL and, and uh, fines work together, you know, like as with before, they were silos. Um, so how it works, how we actually um, do the evaluation, the process that we um, take, and obviously this is a very... Um, um, yeah, it's, you know, I can't sort of go right into it, but, you know, this is this is how we how it works for us. You know, we do, and our clients, we do an evaluation framework and that is done by one of um, my evaluation specialists, uh, Narissa, who is Neris Consulting, and she works and I work really closely with our client to um, look at, the different sorts of methods that we're going to be using, um, most of them focused on participatory approaches. 
and um, we look at, you know, the their framework looks at the purpose and the principles and the ethics and the stakeholder program logic and peer evaluation questions and um, the data collection methods for both the qualitative and the quantitative data. Um, we do not collect the quantitative data. Um, our clients are already collecting that. Um, it's not a part of our tools. Uh, we only collect the um, qual. However, um, sorry, the, the quantitative data. Um, we, sorry, I've totally lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, so in this framework, it sort of focuses on cultural safety um, and, and understanding that we are um, a group of three white women as well and, you know, how, how we are in that. Um, and we look at, you know, the things that we have to look at within our own, you know, that self-reflection of how we actually come to the evaluation, which I'll talk a little bit about a little later in my own personal stories around that. Um, and also the different sorts of principles and ethical um, processes and frameworks that we use in the evaluation. So Narissa does all of this. Um, the, the framework, is kind of like my storyboard when I'm up on country collecting from uh, collecting stories from community members and and stakeholders across country. So um, yeah, it's a very valuable piece of uh, work for me as well. Uh, some of the ethics and some of, this is in a, a evaluation that we're working on at the moment. So examples of a recent evaluation, the different sorts of ethics that we've used um, within the framework and the evaluation is um, the Australian Evaluation Society's guidelines, uh, the National Health and Medical Research Council's ethic guidelines for research in Abor Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander does um, Code of Ethics and also um, the Australian Productivity Commission uh, Indigenous Evaluation Strategy and also the new, um, the new uh, Nabinya um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Evaluation Framework, uh, which we have um, integrated into our processes. So consent is a massive thing in our work um, and we don't take it lightly at all. It's um, in anybody that consents to telling their story at any point in time can have, you know, that story pulled. Um, it's very, we sit down with them and talk with them about how the stories will be used. Um, so they're very aware, you know, every single um, part of the, you know, how the stories are used in the sense of workshops and in reports and as in documentaries. And so in all of our time that we have actually been, uh, collecting stories across country for the last decade. Uh, we've only had one story that's been pulled and that was um, because of a death. And so, but it, it's very easy to go back and re-edit re and take those stories out of the, um, the final pieces if need be without it affecting this, the whole story or the whole uh, report. A lot of our reports are used for years and years and years. Um, the documentary reports, so they have a they have a, um, a quite a, a long life. Um, they use them for education purposes and for a lot of different things. Refunding um, one of um, and it, you know they used it to actually take um, 
to to apply for a um, a program to be taken out of a perpetual funding cycle into a untouchable funds funding cycle, which it is now, which is uh, quite amazing. I'm not saying that that's because of our work, but it was part of the evidence base, you know. Uh, the story collection. So as I mentioned before, the framework that we use um, is used to, for me, you know, by me to collect those stories and who to catch data from, the questions to ask, you know, it includes the consenting process, uh, also the quantity of stories to capture and the visuals to capture as well because it's not just about the stories, it's also about all of the the you know the visual storytelling as well that goes around that so I can uh, pull together a documentary at the end of it as a report um, so you know it's incredibly important to, to be able to get uh, these you know authentic um, stories it's incredibly important to have relationships with the community and, you know, this is where I work really closely with my client um, because they're the ones that have those um, really close relationships. And, I mean, I am quite, not, you know, know enough in the lands now. They sort of have seen me around for some time, but um, that doesn't take away, you know, the importance of having that incredible relationship with my client to be able to. Um, you know, earn the trust of the people that I will be collecting stories from. And, I, th you know, I think that because we've done a few evaluations up there now, they know that we're not ever using their stories out of context. And, um, yeah, yeah I, I certainly don't take any of that uh, trust building for granted, that's for sure. So... Um, you know, giving the community a real voice, you know, that whole thing of um, uh, them being a part of the evaluation from the beginning, not only sharing their stories but but giving feedback on the stories um, that we've um, done the analysis on and had the workshops and yarning circles around to give them that space to be able to share what they're hearing with us um, and then actually be able to take that actually to the to the decision makers and saying hey this is their stories this is what they're saying you know this is what this is what their experience is from their mouth not from anybody else's mouth so um, it's incredibly uh, powerful in that sense um, you know, and we we work really closely with the cultural advisors, which is which is the clients in our case um, in the APY lands. But in any point, it really, really we rely really close, uh, you know, on our clients a lot as the cultural advisors, um, because a lot of the programs that we work with uh, they have quite strong Indigenous teams, so um, they know the communities. And um, we work really closely with the key stakeholders um, and the community representatives and any interpreters that may, we may need to, to use. Um, yeah, I've, I'm also actually starting to learn, you know, a little bit of pitch and jar myself at the moment. So, uh, which I, I'm really enjoying actually, because it sort of gives a lot of context beyond, like to the words that I hear all the time. Uh, beyond my my understanding of just hearing it in a story. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and our, our methodology has this really beautiful ability to be able to actually, um, you know, address those different learning uh, learning styles and engagement styles and, um, you know, whether people are really interested in just listening or engaging, you know, the verbal, the nonverbal, the written, the visual. So it has, it's a, quite a holistic um, tool. 
So uh, I wanted to share with you our um, analytical process that we go through after we've collected the stories um, because it's that's an incredibly important part of our processing. Um, so it's a six-part analytical process and I am the first person that will actually do the first part of their analysing, which is um, editing those films that I've, or those stories that I've collected um, on country and editing them into documentaries, you know, into a series of stories that that answer the questions that we've asked. So, um, you know, there's often, you know, 10 different questions, say, and so all of the different film uh, questions, there might be 50 different answers to that one question. So I analyse it like that. This is all then transcribed. Um, the transcription and the films are then sent off to the evaluation specialist and they actually code it. Um, so we have quite a, um, a large spreadsheet which is all coded, um, which, again, is an incredible tool for me when I then go back into the next process of editing again and using this coded analysis, I create documentaries that will be screened in the, the yarning circles and the um, stakeholder workshops and staff workshops. Um, so then once we have those documentaries, usually I have, I've got about three finished products and those, uh, those documentaries may range from 30 to 35 minutes, say. Um, these, I usually have three of them. Um, depending on what themes have come up really strongly. But a lot of them are looking at the enablers and the barriers and the unintended changes and the most significant change stories as well. So uh, we then have community members and stakeholders um, uh, looking at the documentaries in the workshops and the yarning circles and giving their feedback uh, on what they're hearing in the stories. And they're often different people to what we've interviewed as well. So that we're capturing other people's, um, you know, experiences of the stories. And then we, so all of these workshops that we have, have reports that are written on them, which also uh, contribute to my final products as well and the final re written reports as well as visual reports. Um, then after we've done the community members and stakeholder workshops and yarning circles, we'll, we'll off to come back into the, um, into the cities or the departments that we're working with. And we do workshops with, um, you know, different department stakeholders, um, and, and also different, um, stakeholders within, the same department, you know, so often we'll do internal and external workshops um, with, you know, with stakeholders to analyse the narrative data. Um, so once all of this has been analysed, our evaluation specialist will then analyse and collect, uh, collate the narrative data collected throughout the workshops and this, the outcomes will be used in the report. So it's extremely thorough process. Um, so the different sorts of content that we can create from um, of the report, you know, for reporting process, uh, for uh, reporting products is we have the written workshops and evaluation reports, as I just stated before. Um, so the evaluation report is often just the same as any other evaluation report that you'd see. Um, however, that evaluation report, um, well, not however, but it is used, that evaluation report, and also the, the workshop reports are used by me for lots of different things, um, being the docu-video uh, evaluation report. We use that. Um, I often use the executive summary or depending on what the client is really looking for, there might be other products that come out of it as well. So not only reporting on the findings, um, 
but you know reporting on things that might be you know really useful for uh, interagency or, or interdepartment um, you know learnings or what have you so the docu video report is you know used we we use the evaluation report to create the docu video report so as i mentioned before we actually also have just started using ArcGIS story mapping where we can story map all of the different stories that we uh, create for a project across, um, you know, a ge geographical sort of area. Um, and this is a really beautiful way to actually even show the report in a visual way that, I mean, we all process information differently. Um, and I know, I mean, I was just showing a client an ArcGIS story map that I had created today and she was like, wow, this is so amazing. I you know, I can so take in this sort of information when it's presented to me this way because I can map all the different stories, the finished products. I can also map all the um, the workshop um, documentaries as well as the other documentaries that we may have created um, along the way because, you know, these amazing stories come out, So, which is the other docu-video reports that we create. So as a part of um, and this last evaluation that we've been doing for this client, uh, one of the, the findings or one of the themes that kept coming through was um, the fact that this program was reconciliation or is re reconciliation in action. And we had all these amazing stories to be able to um, you know, show evidence for that. And uh, the department had just recently released its stretch plan, its stretch um, evaluation, uh, not evaluation, uh, stretch reconciliation action plan. And um, we, because of the stories, we were able to um, demonstrate that this was already you know, this program had already uh, fulfilled many of the outcomes that they were wanting to achieve in the next five years. And so we created a few videos. And if I've got time later, I, I can show them, but um, perhaps I'll take some questions in a bit. But I did want to share with you a little about my personal stories and turning the lens on myself and understanding my own colonisation and how um, working on country with our First Nations people has really affected um, not only my personal and professional life, you know, but also my professional life. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, because of um, working so closely uh, with, um, you know, my clients, my First Nations, that, that are First Nations, I've been able to you know, spend many, many hours talking about, you know, lots of different things that are subjects that I probably would have never sort of had the opportunity to talk to anybody about really, you know, being ancestral reverence and, and um, you know, I, because of this, I've, I've actually started uncovering my own ancestor lines and how important that is to me and and, you know, elder, elders, you know, how important elders are in our lives and how I have a lack of them, you know, in my in my world and why is that? And, you know, I, sometimes, I somehow think it's quite closely linked to the reason why we, we don't have a lot of um, reverence for our ancestors either, you know. And, and then understanding that, you know, I too have been colonised and how how do I actually decolonise myself, um, you know, which is a lifelong journey really. It's not a journey that, that started, well, it is a journey that started a couple of years ago, but I see this journey will uh, continue for the rest of my life. In fact, so much so that... I have decided to go back to study and, uh, you know, really want to research into elderhood and, and why in the West we, we lack, um, we don't have those elders in our life. 
Um, yeah, so I really look forward to doing that. And, you know, would have I ever asked these Why questions to myself? They're migrants. And one of the things about migrating is you lose that connection. And that's why people talk about England as being home in the universe. Jesus. Anyway, so um, that um, um, is a little bit about our processes. And if you'd like to find out more about how we work and what we do, uh, happy to chat more. And if you've got any questions, uh, far away. I noticed, thank you, Susan. Uh, I noticed a few requests to see a little bit of the video. So I'm mindful of the time and people like to ask questions, but would you be able to show us a bit of the video? Sure, I can show. So this particular video here is Reconciliation in Action. So this was a video that <clears throat> was one of those videos that um, was an unintended sort of story that came out of the stories that we had collected. So um, I shall share my screen again. Oh, am I still sharing my screen? Or you're you're still showing the uh, presentation. Okay, so do I have to... Yeah, yeah, stop sharing and then stop sharing. Uh, go to the video. Okay, so then I have to share my screen again. Here we are. That's it. Okay. It's about eight minutes long, so um, anyway, we'll see how we go. Well, <laughs> Right, Craig is making it better for the people. We're all happy. We understand the complexity of living in one country. We understand what the government policies and procedures are, and we bridge that gap to come together. And then this person walks out with some form of ID or a driver's license. It is so much bigger than driver's license because once you have a driver's license or a form of ID, you're not limited. It's just the doors start opening. And if we can be one of the gateway programs to help people become an adult in the white man's world, because we know in Aboriginal culture there's the laws and ceremonies that they practice that makes them an adult, so if we can somehow bring the both worlds together by helping them get some more identity so they're able to walk the two worlds confidently. It's, it's being able to participate in society. It's hard to walk, walk in both worlds, in animal world and whitefellow world, if you don't have a, a way to get around and to do it safely and within the law. So sort of an essential tool if you want to spread your wings outside of Yalda at, at any stage. It gives Yalda people the, the ability to function in society without, you know, um, running into the law or um, insurance issues or, you know, all those sort of things that come with the responsibility of driving. So it's, it's a massive uh, leg up and, and bridge between 
animal world and uh, the white feather world. I think the connections, seeing a familiar face as well, has been a, a, a big contributor to that. And the way that the On the Right Track staff are supporting our people out here in the way that they present themselves. They care about the people and they're making sure that they're doing the right thing for people out here. I think the trust as well. So the bonds that they make with the On the Track team, yeah. Like they come down to the communities and help everyone that are on the learners and like feel like they're encouraging us to go for it as well. The staff are friendly. They connect well with the people. It's good seeing our animal people and indigenous people working for our community people and helping getting their license. They have Aboriginal staff who are aware of issues that are unique to, I guess, Aboriginal people and they come out and they're on the ground so they see firsthand too. I think it's like a combination of all these things and then taking all those things into consideration and to make it into a program that works. And I've noticed too that they try to be adaptable too. You can have an idea, but you need to listen to on the ground. And I think that's one thing that makes it work is they're adaptable with working with the community. The understanding of how to register motor vehicles and things like that, like having the service of service to SA um, LinkedIn as well, and being able to talk to the individuals about what it means to have a vehicle, have a license. It's a lot better when the service is coming to the community. They're actually making an effort to have a positive community and enhance that community within themselves as well. I think it's seeing people's willingness that it's possible that they can be part of this system, like the society that people are in, like it just looks too hard to most people. Like for me, I've grown up in this system and it's too hard. My wife fills out most of my forms for me, you know. So on the right track, guiding people through it, it shows them that they can. And even though they're being helped, they're developing these skills to manage the bureaucracy. People don't realise how much uh, bureaucracy and things involve like paperwork and, and things just living out here. So people need those skills. They need to be able to uh, communicate with the government and they need to be able to, to work with it. And On The Right Track is especially doing that. And we really, really appreciate the work that they do out here. So. I just thank you because you give a service that is absolutely vital to our community and um people would be missing out and disadvantaged if you weren't here so it's not just helping them with their on the road things it's helping them with so many other parts of their life you know when you apply for a job when you go to get Centrelink when you want to go see the bank all of those other things you need ID and you need a license and without having on the right track coming out and doing that then you're not just disadvantaging them for on the road you disadvantage them for every part of their life their ability to understand the needs of different communities, especially remote Aboriginal communities, with those language barriers or those self-esteem kind of issues, they're able to target certain people in a way that can enhance that individual, not just for a service point of view, but for the purpose of that person succeeding in getting their licence, whether that's the that ELD or 
um, the next step of our peace. They're keeping the people out here on more of an equal footing with the people in the city, and it's fair. It's a good thing. We really are. We can appreciate that it might be expensive, but to us, being here and, and looking at it and seeing the effect on the people, we think it's vital. You know, it's it's an essential service, really. You know, otherwise, you know, more people will end up in jail for fines. You know, and it, it's unfair. You know? So, as everything's progressing, everything's going more online. Well, it's helping people to go along with that. You know, otherwise people are getting left, right, behind, and it's just unfair. And they'll get to the stage where they they can't participate in our society, and and that's unfair. That's that's not the Australian way. You know. Well, I would like to say, Piava, everyone, and thank you for um, for um, right, right people. Piava, everyone, and people. Thank you for that, Susan. I did notice a request for a different sort of video if there's time. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, before we look at uh, other videos, firstly, Susan, did you have any comments you wanted to make about that particular video or did you want to take questions? Uh, yes, so that one was actually, as I said, that was the reconciliation and action video and that was a video that was made because um, it was, it um, had, become evident that uh, in the feedback that was given to us in workshops and um, in the yarning circles that this program was that doing that. And um, it was just one of those great news stories that it was really important for the program to share with the rest of the, the department that actually there is a program in your department that's already achieving all of these things that you're wanting to achieve in your stretch plan Here's a program that's already doing it. So perhaps you could be looking internally to your programs for, um, you know, some guidance on how to run um, programs for Indigenous people, by Indigenous people, right? So, yeah. No, that's that was good. That <laughs> that's excellent. Um, I think, Theo, uh, you put a, a comment on the chat uh, about uh, MSC. Did you want to ask yeah. a question or make a comment i did i guess I, I was really impressed with what you did very professional and interesting in many ways you used the story so that was great i guess i'm coming from a really strong msc point of view so i wanted to understand the adaption or the variation you made and so just checking my i didn't see anything there about involving anyone in a selection process which is an essential step for msc oh yes so, it's, sorry yes we do and that's just that's part of the workshops um, so because okay. we have a video which is just all the MSC stories. Uh, so okay. we have a video. So the videos might, you know, they vary depending on the client, but uh, we might have three different videos that we show in a workshop. One might be for enablers, one might be for barriers, one might be for unintended changes, and one might be for, well, one it always is for most significant change stories. So we have all of these different videos. The community or the people within the workshops are the ones that actually get to choose what those videos right. are. But there's a very small part of our workshopping, you know, in the sense sure. of uh, it's not just about the most significant change stories. It's about all of the stories. You know, let's analyse all yeah. of those stories and get your feedback on all of those stories. Yeah, sure. The other question I had was... Um, so you involve Aboriginal people in, in shaping your framework so it's culturally appropriate. You collect the stories and now I guess you've signalled to, I was just trying to see where else they got involved. So they could be involved in the selection process too is what you've said as well. Sorry, ask the question again. So I was just trying to get the extent that you involve Aboriginal people. Um, in the selection process of what, sorry? The, the stories in that dialogue process? The MSC stories or the stories as in who am I collecting stories from? Oh, once you've collected the stories and yeah. in that workshop process. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they're very much part of all of that. Cool. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're very much a part of that and central to it, in fact. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Theo. Thanks, Susan. 
Anyone else have a question? Stick your hand up uh, or just speak up. What I, I'm mindful of the time, but I do have uh, a couple of questions for you, Susan. So mm -hmm. I think Theo kind of was uh, asking something similar. So you do all this filming and uh, I presume you capture a lot more film than you actually need to use. And so there's some editing. Who does the editing? Is it just you and then you present what you've edited back to the community? Yeah. So as I uh, explained in that process, um, I'm the first person that does the editing. So I collect the film. I, I do the first edit. It then goes to the M&E specialist. They analyse it and give me a coded dictionary, really, of all the different stories. I then actually create documentaries out of those coded stories, um, that, okay. which then so get created into documentaries. So, yes, I do have a lot of extra material um yeah so out of all the just to give people a, i guess an idea out of the the work you do how many hours would you capture and how much would end up in a a documentary you know and it could be all the little documentaries you generate uh for the mm. project okay so so pretty much okay so pretty much every single story ends up on a documentary somewhere <laughs> like so it is it's never like so as I explained before so we have say we've got five questions just for ease right we've got five yep. questions we've asked I've collected 50 stories those 50 stories will be um there'll be five questions within those 50 stories I'll have my questions up the top and basically 50, 50 answers into that question, 50 answers into that question. Whether they um, actually they all pretty much do um, make the final because so whilst I collect 50 stories, we're not showing the 50 stories to every single community, right? So we might go into APY West. So we just show the APY West stories. We just show the APY East stories to the APY East. We just show the Yalla to Oak Valley stories to Yalla to Oak Valley. We just show the yep. BD stories. So, so then they're just getting to analyse their own community's stories. Otherwise, there's too much data, right? And so yep. then from that, that's where we start the the um weeding out process is not the right word but we start the distilling process of going okay so these are the these are the most important stories in the sense of what with the feedback that we've been given from the communities these themes these stories so this it's really the community that determine what are the most important stories that we're going to be okay. putting into the next documentary which then goes off to the our stakeholders. <laughs> All right, thank you. That that, that helps. Uh, does it, oh, we've got a new message. I just uh, someone just saying thank you. It was great. So uh, the other question uh, for me. So uh, you've explained the uh, the editing and how it ends up going to the stakeholder. Is there any opportunity for influence? You know, either indirectly through yourself or the evaluators or particular parts of the community to bias the results in a particular way or it's no different to any other piece of work it just happens to be on film I think it's actually there's less chance of it being biased to tell you the truth because we're getting so much feedback all the time from different like film doesn't lie number one and it really comes down to the the skill of the interviewer and the you know me being the interviewer behind the camera talking to the person you know like how authentic that story is going to be um they don't shy away from telling me what they need to tell me <laughs> I'll just I'll just put it that way there's um 
And it just happens to be that this particular program is a very good news story. So we heard lots and lots of really good news stories. However, we did actually find out a lot of stuff, which is about the improvement stuff, you know, as well, that uh, will go, that's definitely gone into the written report and it will definitely be going into the, the visual report but it's actually more about the extension of their services. It's not so much about improvements of how they serve the communities. It's really about actually the improvements of we need more of this. We need to, you know, we need to improve how we can translate our L's into our P's. And so there is a lot of that improvement stuff in there as well. I, um, it's that comfortability that somebody okay. has in yep. sharing their story with you. Isn't it? A an expensive process and I'm mindful uh, that some people are needing to leave so uh, yeah we'll wrap up shortly but isn't it yeah. um, well obviously I don't have anything to really compare it to otherwise um, but in talking to people that I've spoken to at different sorts of conferences you know evaluation conferences there's not a lot of difference in my costing to what there would be in somebody else's costing of an evaluation okay that's cool any other questions before we wrap up? Feel free to speak up. If not, um, doesn't seem to uh, be any other questions. I'd like to thank you, Susan, for uh, the interesting talk and the uh, innovative way you're using film to do evaluation. Uh, and thank you for those who've stayed the full course. Uh, it's appreciated. Um, and don't forget, if you're not a member of the AES or would like to come along to future events, just watch out uh, on the website. Uh, we're, locally, we're always hosting events and as are other branches. Um, and uh, I wish you well for Easter and uh, see you at the next event. <laughs>